Good evening and welcome to this week's episode of Sunday Night Live, your favorite automotive show where we tackle the issues that affect the customer experience in your store, whether it's the front of the store, the back of the store, or the middle. It doesn't matter. The greater the experience, the more they come back. They bring their friends, their family, their co-workers, the people they go to church with, their entire online world for everything they need when they need it. And every month we do a uh, monthly Fix Stops Retention Strategies segment. Uh, and this week, uh, Mike Vogel had a, had a conflict, so at the last minute he was unable to join us. But I have my friends Robert Sebastian and Joe Clementi with us here this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And uh, we're going to be talking about onboarding for retention, uh, career path clarity, development opportunities, and some best practices that we've seen. So welcome to the show, gentlemen. Good evening. Thanks for having me, Paul. Hello, everyone. It's nice right, to be here. Those that might not know you, Robert, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about your background, and then we go to Joe. Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Sebastian with GravitationalBusiness.com. We do online training, on-demand service department training. However, just about anyone could benefit from complete care training because no matter the industry you're in, if you learn how to completely care for your clients, they will love you. You become a most trusted advisor for life. And that's what we do, creating most trusted advisors for life and market domination across the nation. Well, wow. Powerful. Mr. Clementi. Yeah, my name is Joe Clementi. I go by Coach Joe. I'm an organizational performance coach and... My day job is the Vice President of Service Operations for Mobility Works, the largest accessible vehicle and adaptive equipment provider in the United States. Glad to be on tonight, Paul. Thank you. And my name is Paul Meyer. I'm your host. Uh, I do sales and service training. I do uh, marketing. And we also have a retail yarn shop and we export yarn all over the world. So we get uh, we get customers both online and person. It's it's an interesting world, and um, our main love is automotive. And um, you know, onboarding we find is critical because a lot of stores. You know, this is my forty fifth year in automotive, and I can't tell you the number of stores that I've walked into, and the new guy or the new gal. They're there a week, sometimes two weeks, and they're just kind of hanging around. There's no kind of onboarding process. There's no career path. There's none of that. So we're going to talk about the why and the how. And these are things that you can use in your store tomorrow. just want to acknowledge a couple of guests. Larry Feldman. Good evening, gentlemen. My buddy from Pennsylvania. Peter Smith from Canada. Good evening, everyone. And Russell Hill. Hello, my friends. All the best to you, Robert and Coach Joe. You guys are awesome. Paul, thanks for the hosting tonight. You're welcome. All right. So, Robert, let's start with you. Why on board? Well, I mean, have you ever had that dream? I've had this dream quite a bit when uh, you wake up in a town that you do not know and you're in your pajamas. I literally used to have this recurring dream when I was a teenager that somehow I find myself in a city I do not know. I'm completely lost. And this was before GPS and cell phones. I don't know anyone. And I'm in my pajamas. I don't know where to turn for help. I'm completely lost. And I mean, I, I could not tell that it's a dream. It was so real that it, it was. And then I would wake up and I was like, oh, I'm home. So, I mean. Without onboarding, that's about how a new employee feels. They feel like they just landed into a, a situation they know nothing about. And yeah, maybe they were in the industry, but now if they're new to the industry even more. Uh, but in some cases, they're the new guy or new girl who's looked at like uh, a threat, maybe. And they're not welcomed. And all of a sudden, they, they simply just feel lost. And of course, they're set up for disaster without a good, solid welcoming onboarding process that helps the new employee, the new staff member, team member, to feel like they belong from day one. You can feel the vibe. 
You know, you want that new employee to feel that vibe. And um, I'll tell you an example in a minute. Should I tell it now? Tell it now. Yeah. So there's a book. It's called It's Your Ship. It's written by Captain Abershov. He took over the worst performing ship in the U.S. Navy. And um, what happened, I mean, the, the morale was the worst. And, of course, they have standards that they had to meet. And they were absolutely the worst. So then when Abershov took over, when new people would arrive to the ship, instead of just letting them wander, and literally they were allowed to wander and find their place, nobody would guide them to their room. Nobody would show them where the chow hall is or, or, or anything. They literally were lost, like felt like a, a little chicken, like the guy who woke up in a city and knows nothing about the city, just completely lost. So Abershov greeted the new hires, so to speak, the new Navy members that were coming to his ship, that were assigned to his ship, and invited him to his quarters, to his office, actually, to the deck, and allowed him to use his phone and said, I want you to call your family from my phone right now and tell them that you had arrived safely. And that just scored big, big points with every new hire that the leader of the ship would do this. And then they assigned a person who would walk the person to their room, kind of like a five-star hotel experience. And needless to say, what do you think happened to the ship within not so much time? They became the best performing ship yeah. in the fleet. Real story. How about you, Lot more went into, A lot more went into that, but that, that was one of the small things that he did. Right at onboarding. It was a great book. Great read, by the way. Thank you for sharing that, Robert. Um, so if we think about a comprehensive strategy for how to retain people, how to really attract talent, how to keep them, how to train them, how to really create a pathway, it begins with onboarding, right? And for many, they think onboarding is paperwork. I, I onboard and I get people to sign paperwork. Paperwork is a process. Onboarding is about culture. And a oh, great quote right there by Peter Smith, right? It's the reality. Paperwork is a process. Onboarding is a culture. And when you create that pathway, you create this strategy around a proper onboarding strategy, that is much more than just paperwork. But as Robert said, showing the, the way, uh, there's, there's a great um, survey called the Gallup 12. And that, that survey is really about how the experience were for each team member. What are the most important questions asked those team members during that process? But you have to start at the very beginning. When someone comes on, the first question they have is, hey, where do I park? Where do I, who do I report to? Hey, do I bring my lunch? Is there lunch provided? Do they have a refrigerator? Where should I park? And where should I go when I come in? Is there gonna be some place to eat close by? I mean, all these unknown questions are popping up in their head. And they're not even thinking about, okay, what do I do on my first day? So a good strategy, a good onboarding plan is to engage the team member right then and there with your values, your culture, your vision, your mission. Engage the team member in, okay, what does it look like for you to become the same member that Robert is five years from now? How do you get there in a shorter period of time, avoiding the mistakes and engage in the skills that you bring us, right? Instead of just the, you know, when someone comes on board, it's like sink or swim. I, I hire them right. and you sink or you swim. There's pros and cons, right? It, pros are, hey, they're going to help your team immediately. The cons are you don't know what skills or lack of skills they're bringing with them that they're going to try and implement in your environment that's not necessarily conducive to your culture. And so why when you start the onboarding process, it really begins with a pre-onboarding, right? And then there's uh, further steps along the way, and I'm sure we're, we'll talk about it, but I, I really believe it's more about culture, as I, as I always talk about when on this show. Culture is everything. I believe that... Um... In onboarding, your onboarding process needs to be a, a, a structured onboarding process, okay? Whether you're dealing with a recruiter or not, you know, if, you're if your company is dealing with a recruiter before bringing the, the person on, they need to know all of the things that these two gentlemen just talked about. 
okay? As simple as it may sound, where to park, bring a lunch or not bring a lunch, right? These are important things. The, the recruiter has a, some sort of a relationship with the, the new hire, and then that gets handed off to their manager, okay? The manager will then typically provide them with all of the, um, you know, all of the portals that they need to log into, what their logins are, uh, any modules or any certifications that they need to do, okay? So that, you know, depending on whether this is something that you do as a one week, a two week, or a four week or more, it tells the prospective employee or the new employee that, hey, this is a company that has their stuff together. They want to make sure that I'm set up for success. And by providing me with all of the tools that I need to, I can gear up so that on day one, I know where to go. There's a map where to park, what time I'm expected to be there, what items I need to complete on a checklist. A lot of companies, they'll send out a, a document which has all of the items that the, the new recruit or the new employee has to complete with specific dates on them, okay? Because that, again, it tells them that, that the company has their stuff together. You're not going into some haphazard place where it's fly by night. They actually have a plan. And successful yeah. companies, um, you know, I'm going to mention Carter Myers as, as a, an automotive group. You know, they have an incredible onboarding process. Everybody knows what to expect before they get there. I got a couple of comments here I want to get to. Um, yeah, we mentioned Peter Smith before dealers mistake orientation or onboarding. Those are two distinctly different items. Very much But so. equally important, I believe. And Robert Allen Carvel says dealers don't take the time to onboard their employees. Old school. Dealers are doing their new employees a disservice without a great onboarding process. Taking time to properly train and make sure the new hire is ready to take on their new role is imperative to a successful business. Make sure you're letting your employee, letting the employee you are investing in their careers to work here. I mean, I, I couldn't have yeah. said it any better. You know? think, think about the whole cycle of trying to recruit someone, right? You're looking yeah. for someone who has the necessary skills to fill a gap in your business. Yeah. And you're going out and you're spending this money to recruit, to attract that person to your organization. And for those organizations that don't have a good onboarding strategy, they take that team member, they spent all this money to try and attract, and they plug them into an environment without any strategy without any guides or without any guideposts, right? It's kind of like bowling when you're little without those rails on the side, or if you're me, without those rails on the side, you're gonna be hitting the gutter more often than you are the pins. And so when we think about onboarding, it's the same analogy, right? We yeah. recruit the best talent because we know they have the skill to do the job and onboarding isn't necessary about the skill, it's the integration into your workplace. And so you talked about a lot of the elements, right? Having a plan that sets the pre-date, the what to expect when they arrive, having their equipment ready for them, i.e., like you said, logins, where are they going for their training? Do you have a training portal that you host them on? Do they understand your culture? Do they understand your vision? Do they have a portal where they can go and train to learn how, if we speak automotive, specifically fixed operations, where do they go to know how to use your system? And if they're an expert in your system, where do they go to learn how you want the repair orders written, how you want the clients greeted, what that expectations are in terms of whether it's a shop foreman or perhaps how, how are things delegated? And then more importantly, if you're on a team, how do you get to know what their strengths are? How do you know what your leader's strengths are? What to expect from a leader role? That's all that integration. Um, and when you think about onboarding, uh, I'll speak specifically for our organization. We have a 10-day plan. Then we have a 60 and a 90-day plan. So the, the, the integration is saying, here's for the first 10 days what you can expect. Here's the next 30. 
and here's the next 90. So in that transition, the person is learning what are expected of them in their role as they are transitioning into our organization. And that strategy coupled with the right cultural, right environment really ensures that there's more engagement in your philosophy and in, in what you want to achieve as an organization. That's so good, Joe. And you know how every company gives out an employee handbook, which is mainly legal stuff. And of course they have benefits in there, which is very necessary. We have to give every new hire very clear guidance as to their benefits, as to holidays, vacation, policy, uh, health care, and all that. However, very few companies actually have a good book for like a, uh, all of their processes, you know, all of their process for how do we sell work, for example, in fixed operations, if you subscribe to complete care, to say we subscribe to complete care and this is how we sell work. These are our expectations of our technicians that we complete a multi-point inspection. If it's with video, then with video, with pictures, whatever the case might be. And this is how we sell work. That's our process so that nobody can come back later, which I, I just recently even heard um, an independent shop owner. But I've also ran into technicians that said this because they were not onboarded correctly that, hey, I thought our uh, mission was to help customers, not to sell them stuff. Because they did not understand that when you tell customers about the needs of their vehicle, that's you're not trying to sell them stuff. You're doing them a favor. And what a disconnect between the purpose of a, a technician. This technician was not trained correctly from their school, from whoever was guiding them before. And he would do whatever the customer came in for and then not look the vehicle over. So tires, brakes, whatever the case might be. So that has to be in a process. And I prefer laminated, you know. <laughs> Laminate these things uh, in a three ring binder that you tell them this is a living document, that this is a continuous improvement document, that as we find better ways to do things based on employee suggestions, based on what we learn about the industry, based on customer needs, we're going to update this document. And I prefer a three ring binder for that reason, because you can add a sheet to it anytime you'd like, or you can delete one whenever you want. Uh, but who should do the onboarding? You know, in the best organizations, the highest possible ranking person gets involved. So you mentioned Carter Myers. We know Lisa Borges is, is always in there. When, when they hire a new group of people, she goes in and meets the new hires and, and greets them and welcomes them into the company, gets to know them as much as humanly possible. And of course, she can't do it all because obviously she's got some responsibilities. But I would definitely say that the immediate supervisor needs to block out that day to be dedicated Absolutely. to this new hire yeah. as a manager. And yeah, of course you can do stuff because this new hire will have to do some tasks on their own. So in that time, the supervisor or manager can do other things. However, if we don't separate the time to welcome them correctly, to make them feel like they belong with the way we walk them through their workstation, uh, provided those tools that they need, give them the logins and everything. If they don't feel 100% that we care, then we're going to have to deal with the consequences of a poorly onboarded person who becomes a dissatisfied employee. It's just no ifs, ands, or buts. It happens every time. Uh, they become an, another valued employee, valued, right? Uh, which you know, people use sarcastically that term and say, I'm a valued employee when they don't feel valued at all. So that first that first day, the first interactions with the immediate supervisor, because you know what they say, statistics show that people do not quit companies. They don't quit their jobs. They quit their immediate supervisor. They quit their immediate leader, which is why it's such a big impact of the immediate leader uh, to show that he is indeed or she is indeed what I call a Mitch leader, a person who models the right behaviors, the caring, the complete care, inspires the person to great performance by getting to know them and by listening to them, by caring for them. So you don't inspire them by trying to motivate them by, by doing hoorah, just go do this, do that. But instead, listen to them, find out all of their needs and make sure that the first day they are convinced that this place is completely committed to their well-being and their career success. 
when you have the, you know, there's an old Italian saying, the fish thinks from the head, right? When you have top leadership involved in the onboarding process and then have a, the, a couple layers down in management carry out that onboarding, you know, that, that instills in the, in the employees that there's, there's a sense of culture and a sense of teamwork within this organization, right? When everything is, is spelled out, written out, what, what they can expect, it, it just sets them up for success uh, right out of the gate. Now, the, uh, the educational component is also key because, like you said, everybody comes in with a different skill set, right? You hire for attitude and, and you train for skill, but by evaluating all of the people, as to what they're going to need to be up to speed as to how you run your company, uh, that gets everybody more into a, a team atmosphere uh, where they're better geared up to not only do the job, but as new employees come on and they move up into the ranks, they understand that they are now part of that onboarding process. It's, it's their responsibility to also help the rest of the team. Now, when... When an employee comes in, you know, we, we talk about, you hear a lot of talk about career path, but what does that really mean, right? How many companies really spell out for their employees what the opportunities are, okay? You start at this level here. We want you to become more proficient in these other items here. And as you acquire those skills, you'll become a more valuable team member to the organization. And as such, you'll enjoy the following perks or the following yes. perk or the following schedule, whatever. You need to find out what's important to that particular employee. And it's not always money. It's, it, in my opinion, it's up to the company to determine what everybody's why is so that when they set up these career paths, you're aligned with what's important to that individual. If a uh, if, uh, work-life balance is important, if time off is important, well, guess what? As they achieve certain levels, maybe for that person, particular days off or a weekend off might be that secret sauce that, that really motivates them. For others, it's gonna be money. There are people that are just in it for the money, plain and simple. And you know what? That's okay. It's not for me to tell you what's right or what's wrong. It's up to us in the leadership capacity to determine what motivates that person. So if money is what's important to that particular person when they achieve those specific objectives, then that ties to a certain dollar amount or whatever the case may be. Make sense? I think that's really important though, right? If if someone is money motivated and we're speaking specifically about the automotive world, that can be okay. So yeah. long as it connects to the company's values and what you expect of that person. So the example I'm going to use is, is if you hire someone whose only objective is money and the client interaction or the client experience is irrelevant, or Robert's my coworker and his opinion doesn't matter because all I want to do is make money, then, then you don't have a connection with your values, right? And so I think it's okay to have the person that's money, motivated, money inspired. In fact, it's probably really good in a competitive environment, so long as it mirrors your company values, right? So long as they understand how their skill sets fill the void or the gap in performance to align with the values. And I think that's really important part. And you won't know unless you onboard that person properly, right? right. Unless you, you build that pathway. You know, I'll speak, if I may, just for a second, what we created for our, our technicians. We created a five-tier technician pathway that has expectations for certifications, but we also include the practical application because unlike the traditional automotive, we're installing complex uh, systems and controls for those clients uh, living with disabilities to help them drive, right? To help them become mobile. 
So a lot of that is the practical skill sets. It's actually time and tenure, and it's passing certain certifications along the way. And as they graduate through each tier, there are rewards. So they get incentive rewards, monetary, but they also get non-monetary rewards like more PTO time, one-time payout. Right. They get a thousand dollar tool allowance. And as they progress yes. to each tier, they get more allowances. And the progression of that tier is time and tenure so that our technicians can model our behavior, right? The things that we want them to be. Stay with us, grow with us, learn with us, um, and create, bring your working knowledge, your genius to an organization. And then we teach them along the way. That career path is an exciting way for people to connect with the vision and values of the company, but also to say, hey, if I do these things, there's an end result for me. There's a reward beside money, but there is money that ties into it as well. Right. I want to get to a couple of comments. Uh, Peter Smith says NADA suggests onboarding takes two years for fixed ops while they have nothing for variable. That's interesting because there's a lot of turnover in variable and all of it costs you money. Uh, Peter says, turnover costs are not looked at when hiring as it's not on the financial statement. If it were, dealers were more focused on it and though osmosis and through osmosis would carry through to onboarding and retention. Right. Uh, I have somebody's coming across here as LinkedIn user. I'm not quite sure who that is. Uh, for those, if, if you have a comment and we don't respond to it, then it's possible that there is a glitch between LinkedIn and uh, StreamYard where sometimes comments don't show up in real time. Uh, they show up after the fact, um, after the, the live is over. So if you're one of those, feel free to send a uh, direct message in uh, LinkedIn Messenger because I certainly don't want to miss uh, any of your, of your comments. Let me see if I can see who that person is. There is, uh, as you're looking for that, I think there's direct links between onboarding, creating a career path, you know, generating a future for the team member and aligning their values with your company values. It's all part of that strategic approach, right? How to connect every, all those dots together. It's not linear, right? Sometimes it's, it's in, it's in a circle. Sometimes it's, it's a little wavy, but as long as you're circling back to the center point of the values and vision and purpose of the, and the culture, then the behaviors that are outside of that can be uh, more finely tuned with what's necessary to, to achieve that next level achievement. And when people aren't aligned, when they're not brought in correctly, hence your point about variable turnover, the only alignment is how much money you make for me or right. how much, how good are you at making money? And when there's a mix between the values of the individual and the values of the company, those cross cross paths, they, they never work, right? They, they, they counter affect each other. They're counterintuitive. Now I have yeah, to say that, you know, uh, things have changed quite dramatically uh, from the way it was and the way it is now. I remember, uh, you know, some of the stuff that, that, used to pull in shops, unbelievable. I remember walking through the locker room one day and I'm hearing noise coming from inside a locker. I'm thinking, what the hell is that noise? Well, I opened the locker door and it was the new hire. The new hire, they had duct taped his mouth and his hands and they stuffed him in a locker. When I took him out and I, I cut the duct tape off, the guy bolted, he was gone. You know, that, that would never fly today. No. Uh, Freddie says, have a written onboarding process, spend time with new hires and let them know they are part of the team, not just another body. That That's key. It's super powerful. Yeah, along with that, you got to have a mental preparation. So part of that written process is for the supervisor to mentally prepare to welcome this person, almost like a host, a hostess, to, to really be intentional about letting them feel that they're welcome and that starting today, we're in this together. We really are committed to your success. 
And that person should be like, okay, I think I, something just hit me. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe I'm dreaming. But to have this feeling, overwhelming feeling that they have all the support they need to achieve all of their career goals. And also when they have some kind of issues, personal issues, that they are free to come to the, the manager or know the key personnel within the organization that can also help with different issues. And what's very important is, I mean, look, let's face it. It's always busy at the at the dealership, right? You have the best of intentions. You have a, a set plan for the day, and five things interrupt that plan, and sometimes you're off on a different trajectory, right? But right. when it comes to the new hire, it is critically important that you set reminders in advance so that you know who's coming, what their name is, what they're coming in for, and that you're able to make the time to welcome them and aid in that onboarding process. Because I want to address something here, Paul. Yeah, what do you got? So if you're in a smaller shop where you're working, you're a working uh, service advisor manager, you know, you, you're having to write customers up. If you're in yeah. a smaller shop, you know you're hiring a new person, whether it's a technician, service advisor, warranty administrator, whatever the case might be, you'll want to schedule less work. I'd rather take care of the technician some other way or schedule a bunch of used car PDIs for that day, new car PDIs, but free up yourself. You've got to free yourself up and you have to empower someone, maybe the GM and tell the GM, GM, today I need your help. My service advisor is going to go to you with the fires that I usually put out and I need your help. You put them out. I trust you. You can make some good decisions, yeah. you know, because we're on the same page here. As far as the culture goes, we're taking care of customers and it can be done because we're a team. I, I really do believe that the GM is the general manager. He's also the manager of the fixed operations, not just variable. So you really do have to be so prepared for that day. And um, and then you're setting your new hire up and yourself for success. Yeah, no, that's 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 a great point right there. Uh, you know, you know it's going to get crazy, so why not plan in advance for a little less crazy, so that you can invest in that new person that's coming on board. Yeah, and imagine how that person feels, right? Like they're the yeah. number one important thing on behalf of that service manager that day. How do they feel now, right? They feel like, wow, this is really, you know, this this organization is better than my last one. I just went in the shop and picked up my tools and started working. Or I went to my desk, I logged in, and all of a sudden I've started working, right? And a good onboarding is is amazing. Yep. Hey, there are welcome three David. things. Sorry, go ahead. You... No, I said, welcome, David. He says, uh, good morning, team. Must be on the other mm -hmm. side of the pond. He's in Australia. Hey, David. Hey, David. Ah. Yeah, our, our Australian friend. Hey, so there's three assessments that I believe we should do when uh, we're doing onboarding. One is a skills assessment. The other one is a personality assessment. And the third one, a dreams assessment. And we talked about it. This is hand in hand with the why. Find out what's their why. But yeah. the skills assessment is to avoid imposter syndrome. I literally talked to a guy recently who was called into a meeting and he was hired into this new company. And, and he's this new guy who was going to fix all kinds of things in this company and he's being called into this meeting by his boss and he said he had no clue about the particular topic that they were about to talk about but he was expected to know and he's like how am i going to confess i had to confess that i have no idea what we're talking about that's not an area that i i dealt in he knew the industry really well and he was fully qualified to do the job but this particular issue he had no knowledge about so he had to confess but it's good to have a skills assessment, even though the, the new hire comes in with a great resume and find out what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, and have this open conversation about, hey, you don't ever have to fake it. You know, if there's something that you don't know before you take a step in that direction that you're just sort of sure about, we have support for you. We've got me. We've got the foreman. If it's a technician, right, you can go to the foreman. This is a no judgment zone. Our goal is to have you successful to reach your potential and for all of us to succeed together. Because if you have to hide something, then we're all in trouble. Also a clear understanding. What do we do when the, you know, what hits the fan? If, so, if we make a mistake again, this is a no judgment zone. You fess up to the mistake. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to JB weld it. 
you know, come to the your service advisor, come to the manager. We're going to take care of the situation. This is not a place where you need to worry about being punished for your mistakes. Now, obviously, if somebody gets drunk every day and they're going to cause issues, well, we know what the outcome of that is going to be. But so other than that, to have an open policy where the people feel comfortable in talking about their challenges. I think if you're going to do that, then you said earlier, and I believe this to be the case as well, they have to have a clear understanding of why. Right. And if you can't go to any member of your team that's been existing and ask, hey, wh why, why do we do what we do? If they can't clearly define it, then the culture isn't clear. The culture is driven by the majority, right? And the majority of the people will drive that culture rather than the organization driving the culture. And it exists whether you like it or not, it exists whether you admit it or not. So if they're clear about their why, if you can ask a new team member, hey, why, why do we do what we do every day? And your team member is very clear on the why, then they will definitely help drive that culture that you want to create. Tony I, Shea, who's the CEO of Zappo, said, and, and I'll try to make sure I say it exactly the way he did, right? But if you get the values and the culture right, success will inevitably happen. So if you think about that, right, if you get the values and the culture right, success happens, right, as a result. And he can speak to it. That's, that's why culture matters so much. And if they do understand the why and they're connected, the rest becomes a lot easier. Once you know the why, the how becomes really easy. Yes. You know, Jack Gardner, have not spoken to Jack in quite some time. Welcome, man. He says, dealers don't plan new hires. They constantly hire out of necessity. When you need a body, don't be surprised when that's exactly what you get. Okay. No amount of onboarding will overcome the wrong hire. That's 100%. You need to invest the time to make the right hire. And you need to but cultivate good, them from within. Good onboarding will kind of weed the wrong hire out because the person doing the onboarding will have this feeling that this person is just not a good fit for our culture. So even there, the onboarding helps because as you're walking this person through and you're talking about your values, uh, your core values, your beliefs, your behaviors that are expected, and the fact that if you're money hungry, that's OK, but we're going to chase money with integrity. And we know that when you care more for people, both for employees and for customers, you're going to make a lot more money than if you try to achieve any kind of financial success in a shady way, trying to, to take shortcuts or to try to sell stuff that simply is not necessary. Uh, that's just going to cause disaster. That's not a way to make money. But, yeah, you can weed out the bad apple even even if you accidentally said okay well we're going to invite you to go ahead and and start working with us but as you're doing that onboarding you're going to have this overwhelming feeling i think we made a mistake and you'll have you'll have to hand walk that person quite a bit in the first few days and maybe it has happened to me in two days i had to sit down with this employee and i said uh look we have one chance here we're going to change your pay plan from at back then it was $30 an hour down to $10 an hour. And we're going to put you in our apprenticeship program. And that's your only chance. If you'd like to continue with us, you had misrepresented everything about yourself. And that's your only chance. And this person said, well, can I go another day with 30 bucks an hour? And I said, nope, not another minute. So if you'd like to enroll into our apprenticeship program starting tomorrow, you can come back. But right now you need to go home. You have completely lied about everything. So, you know, that's, how it happened, this person really misrepresented everything we believe what was on the resume. Maybe we, we failed in the follow-up, in the in the uh, checking out the references, but it was quickly evident that this person does not belong. And sure enough, she didn't come back the next day. And with the right onboarding, you know, we've, we've, we've all said it, is how you develop your culture, right? The automotive business and the hospitality business, they share a lot of similarities, okay? And uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Steve DiFilippo. He owns Davio's Northern Italian Steakhouses. 
Uh, started as one in Boston that he took over. It had a lot of issues. And I believe he's got probably 11 or 12 at this point. I've been to eight of them around the country. And they have such a, a, a culture there, okay? Steve says, I don't have to worry about firing anybody. They know what's expected of them, and they do it. And when they feel they are no longer in alignment with the company's mission, some of these people choose to leave on their own, yep. right? I mean, if turnover happens, wouldn't you rather have somebody leave on, on, on those terms because they feel that they can no longer support the mission rather than have to get into some giant bruja? And Freddie loves your, uh, loves your saying, Robert overwhelming support he's going to steal that one just so you know well look the, the reason i say overwhelming is because some of us are wired so so much to negativity perhaps uh reasonable that we are because of previous experiences right we have been let down so many times you know for example technicians for sure they always they, they work in so many places some technicians have this perception that most places do not care for them so because of that, you have to shock and awe with care. You, you have to over literally overwhelm them, just, just uh, you know, spread it all over, spread the, you know, the care and the support in, an, in a way that they cannot mistake it for anything else. But the fact that we want them to succeed, we literally are available to them to help them find the logins, get the training, uh, follow the career path if they want to grow. And of course, outlining the career path if they want to be master technician, shop foreman, and that's their dream to be until retirement, great. If not, then showing them they, they can go laterally, become a service advisor, then service manager, service director, GM, and maybe a partner in a car dealership one day. There have been many cases of this happening, but they have to feel that from day one. And then, of course, we're not going to do like the guy who uh, was an HR director. Do I have the time to tell this story really quick? Two, two minutes. This HR director who who, um, who died and, and went to heaven and St. Peter said, hey, we have a new program. Uh, you can check out heaven for a day and hell for a day. And you can choose where you want to go. And uh, he said, all right, sounds good. So I went to heaven one day in Golden Streets, lots of music, everybody praising the Lord. It was pretty cool. And then the next day he goes to hell and the devil comes out in the Hawaiian shirt and says, hey, buddy, come on in. We got a bunch of drinks at the Tiki Hut music is playing and, and all kinds of, you know, Beautiful ladies waiting for you. So sure enough, drinks, party. He parties a whole day and goes back the next day to St. Peter and says, St. Peter, I didn't think that uh, I would say this, but I want to go to hell. So St. Peter says, go to hell. So he goes to hell. The devil comes out with a pitchfork and sticks him in the rear end and straight into the fiery lake. And he's like, hey, wait a minute. Yesterday, this was a party. What happened? And he said, well, yesterday we were recruiting you. Today, you're an employee. So... No, you know, we're not going to do an awesome onboarding and then forget about them. I think, Paul, you said it earlier that you schedule check ins with your employees and you have, uh, Joe, what, a, a 60 day, 90 day thing where we follow up and make sure that we check on their progress. We have a scoreboard to let them know how they're doing. Yes. And, uh, and it has to be formal. It has to be formalized so that they know how they're doing. I, I went through a period of time when I literally would meet with my GM when I was a new service manager. I had no idea how I'm doing because this guy never gave me any feedback. I was doing good, but he's like, hey, what, what's your problem? I said, man, we haven't met in three months. You're not telling me anything. We're meeting in the hallway on the way to the bathroom, and you say, you're doing good. Okay, you're doing good. And I'm like, yeah. What? Yeah, it has to be more than that. I'm a firm believer, right? So if we're going to, if we're going to take the time to find the right people for our shops, then I want to make sure that I've got each person's plan mapped out for them specifically with uh, achievements I'd like them to achieve by specific dates. And that's something and what they can expect as in return for them. I want the dates on, I want specific actions. I want specific training, I want dates, and I want the employee to sign it, and I want the manager to sign it, and that the employee gets a copy of that so that they know, and then that the management takes ownership of 
that career path with that individual. It's not just, hey, it's been 90 days, you know, what happens? No, throughout those 90 days or whatever that, that period of time is, there's nothing wrong with encouragement. Hey, you're doing great. You've achieved, you know, so far you've achieved 40% of the objective. Great going. Is there anything else I could do to assist you to help you get to that next step sooner, right? That shows them that you care and, and that's, that's going to get them more motivated to achieve the things that you need them to achieve. Because guess what? At the end of the day, we all have the same goal that we can better serve the customers. But you can't have happy customers without happy employees. And you're not going to have that without making the investment in time. Let me get to a and, couple and you of said comments. something that, if I may, that's really yeah. important. You got to schedule those one on ones. Yeah. So they have to be scheduled so that the, the team member feels like there's nothing more important right now than getting the feedback for how I'm filling the role and yes. what my progression might look like. And too yeah. often, as Robert said, you know, we do the Pelican management, right? Where we fly by and shit on everybody until things improve, right? And so the whole- It doesn't work. Right, it doesn't work. The most effective way is scheduled one-on-ones to talk about progress, to talk about opportunities, and to talk about the things, the behaviors and activities that align the organizational values. When you think about organizational performance, generally thinking, oh, speaking, we're only looking at a financial statement. I'm a winner, right? In my 20 group, or I'm a winner because I'm generating this much revenue or net profit. The reality is people make that a winner. People, organizational values are supplemented by having the right people. And the right now, people align with that. In scheduling that, okay, you're also getting to know that employee, right? You're taking the time to invest in their careers, which helps your career, but you're getting to know them also. A success story that, uh, that I like to mention is Ed Roberts at Bozard Lin Ford Lincoln, okay? There's a company that they know all about their employees, okay? When I went down for Ed's book signing, I met literally every employee in the building. But before I met each employee, Ed told me their story, okay? That's huge. And he didn't tell me from a notepad or from a book or from his, a note on his phone. No, he told me from in here and in here. He told me their story. And as he introduced me to each person, hey, I'd like you to meet this guy. Hey, why don't you tell Paul your story? And that sto the person's story mirrored, mirrored, but with that person's pride, what Ed relayed to me moments earlier, right? So that scheduling to, to check in with the employees, to make sure that they're on the right track to achieving the things they need to, that's invaluable. I'm going to get to a couple of comments so we don't fall behind here. Uh, David Lukak says, the first day for the new team member can be daunting. So it's our job to have everything ready for a great induction. And when I when he says everything ready and I see everything ready, I'm not talking about here's my login for a particular program. No, you're our new employee. Here's your logins for all of the programs that you're going to need to become successful in our organization. And if there's something that I need to do for you, please, let me know anytime. I'm here for you. Ron Usher says, it's simple. Always tell the truth. Couldn't be any more simple. The people that, that lie, you can't remember all the lies, but you'll never forget the truth. Right? Great point, Ron. Uh, Ron. And David Lukak says, great discussion, gentlemen. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Paul, I want to give our audience a question that I think is really powerful 
that on these check-ins we can ask and it's worth giving it to them from day one. If there's ever any obstacle in you doing your best work, I'd like to know. So is there any obstacle to do to for you doing your best work right now? That's always a good question, but also a question to have in their folder and say, if there is any obstacle to you doing your best work, feeling like you belong, and, and if there's any concerns other than, well, well, just an obstacle, they all end up being an obstacle to the person doing their best work because it messes up the head if there's something going on, whether it's a personal conflict, whether there's a yeah. tool missing, whether it's the lighting, the environment, uh, whatever. We want to know. And then, of course, you can't just say, hey, it's so good to listen to people, right? We say it's the, one of the most important things to listen. But listening without follow-up, without action means nothing. And it's yeah. so important in those early days when you have a new employee. Now, I'm not talking about but the guy that wants to buy every special tool out of the special tool magazine that has nothing to do with any of the work that you're doing because he likes shiny objects. But... Things that are necessary for their job or literally if there's a light bulb out right above their workstation, it needs to be fixed right away. And if you don't have anybody else, you, the manager, climb up on the ladder, which, of course, most service managers will do gladly. And that's the sign of a good service manager. Or if it's hot and you don't have an air conditioned shop and it happened to be the hottest summer ever, buy the Gatorade, get the ice and get some extra fans and assemble them right in the middle of the shop. And yeah, well, I guess it would sound like I'm bragging if I say I did that, but I did. Um, it's not bragging if it's true, remember. It's not bragging if it's true. But you know, I didn't know what I was doing at that moment. I was, I just did it there, but in fact, it did solidify my relationship with the techs because I was out there with them in the heat. I, I didn't just stay in the, in the AC office. I was out in the heat. I, I ran a not air conditioned shop in the beginning. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so pay attention, not just listen, but follow up on their request. But the question again is, is there any obstacle for, from you doing your best work right now? Please let me know whatever it is. And it's critical to support them, right? The amount of pressure today is unbelievable. I don't know how many people know this story uh, or how many people know uh, my friend, John, our, our friend, John Frazier, okay? Uh, John Frazier had a young man drive, I think, seven hours with his wife to explore an opportunity to go work at uh, John's Ford store as a technician, okay? We never know the type of pressure that people are under, okay? This this guy, he and his wife, they drove seven hours. John put him up in a hotel. John met with them at nighttime. The next day, uh, the, techni the technician was going to the, to the store to, to meet with John and, and, and the rest of the team. Uh, that morning, they went to breakfast. They went back to the hotel. And... The guy had a heart attack and died that morning at the hotel, okay? So you never know how much pressure people are under. Um, so it's very important to have an outlet for them. You know, I, I love the way you put it, Robert. If there's ever anything that gets in the way or anything that you need help with, that's also a critical part of onboarding, in my opinion, is they need to know that there's there's support for them for these different issues that that happen in life. Well, and, you know, we didn't address this, but I think it's worth mentioning when you're hiring ladies in the shop, most shops, I believe today are welcome into women. However, that has to be clear that if there's any shadow of a doubt of that or any concerns, by all means, that we are listening and, and we would address them right away. It's a safe environment. Or if it's a guy and, and there's bullying going on, which has happened in a shop environment at times, no, it's not something that we stand for. That's not our culture. 
this is a safe environment where everyone will grow and do really well and will feel cared for. And that's what we stand for. But there's an open door policy. You never feel like, like something's off limits. Right. They and and that's where culture and values align, right? So if right. you're in alignment with that, then you don't allow that bullying to happen, right? If you're in alignment with the right culture, then you don't allow um, mistreatment of other people. The same is true is if you have a top selling salesperson and they do things that are unethical to obtain more revenue and we turn a blind eye because, well, they're generating a lot of revenue to keep the store moving, then you're basically selling your values out for yeah. a dollar. And yeah. when you're incongruent with that, what do you think people see? They see the incongruence, right? They see the mistreated. Well, I won't fire Robert because he's been our top technician all these years and he's a high producer. Yet, Robert, in my example, is bullying other technicians, then we've said we'll turn a blind eye to that, right? We've said we'll tolerate that behavior in lieu of the hours, in lieu of the revenue. Instead of finding out what's gen why, why, in my example, this technician, Robert, is mistreating people, right? So you got to have that congruence. And if you don't as a leader, then th that's why there's division in, in a store, in an environment. And right. unless you are willing to actually look under it at a macro level or even a micro level, uh, those things will exist whether you realize it or not. Yeah, no, that, that, that is definitely something that, you know, the, the employees need to understand that they will be heard and that you have a certain, you know, you have certain policies that there are lines that you can't go over. Absolutely. Hey guys, um, just going back just a little bit on the career path, we have to have the confidence to know that if we don't offer the opportunity for growth, someone else will. So right. in a multi-store organization, sometimes we're competing against other managers, but we're better off if there's an opening for a shop foreman at another shop within the organization to let your best tech that you dearly love, but he deserves a promotion or she deserves a promotion. Yeah. Let him go to the other location and let them become the shop foreman there and let them have that opportunity because otherwise they're going to leave you anyways. Right. And then I do believe that you will be treated over a long period of time the way you treated others. The golden rule works that when you will need a tech they will help you. That other manager all of a sudden will say, man, he allowed me, he let me have his top tech as a shop foreman. So if somebody's applying to him that he doesn't need at the moment, he'll send them right to you. It really does work. So if we don't allow our people to grow in our organization, don't give them opportunities, somebody will. So we might as well be the ones to be intentional about it, outline that career path and help them grow. Invest in them, hundred percent, Robert. Invest in them, and the more you invest, the greater the return. Ron Archer says, "Not all techs want money, but they do like a little appreciation." Here, here. Russell Hill, what a great show tonight! Thank you, Russell. Appreciate it. Thank you, that. Russell. Thank you. And Freddie Fabulio, Paul Meyer was absolutely. We should absolutely have written goals and actions reviewed at thirty. 60 and 90 days because we do have to hold people accountable but we also need to show them that we are invested in their success success culture matters that's a, yeah that's what i love about having it written and signed on both ends because it shows both sides of the commitment you know that's key wow we've come to the end of just about another hour. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to impart upon our guests? I think just one thing, Paul and Joe, is when good onboarding happens and ongoing support and the kind of stuff that, that we talked about, culture that Joe talks about so much and synergy sets in and all of a sudden the results of an organization that works this way, that cares for their staff from the first minute throughout their career with you, your results will be out of this world, far beyond what others think are possible. 
And I would follow Robert's outstanding comments with like this. What if we treated our best team members like we treat our best clients, our best customers? If we treat our team members like our best customers, it's recyclable, right? Every The return on investment triples. That's all I have to say. And I want to follow that up with you cannot have in, uh, customer retention without employee retention. And you cannot have employee retention until they know how much you care. Jackie B. Cooper, I had the cassette tapes in my car I used to listen to back in the day. And in his Southern drawl, that man said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So with that, I want to thank my uh, co-panelists here. Thank you very much. I want to thank the audience, those that watched live today, those that commented, those that just watched, and those that watch on the replay. Your support is very much appreciated. Uh, we do our best to bring you content that you can use. Try to stay away from the regurg regurgitated stuff. Hope please you value in what we bring to the table. And uh, we'll see you next week on Sunday Night Live. Gentlemen, stay on when we go off here. John thank Gonsfax. you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Thank um, you, everyone. Jennifer Sanford, thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next week on Sunday Night Live.